Hey everyone! Before we begin today, we want to thank our newest patrons, Shadow Queen and Viva La Couch Dog. Very cool names today, and welcome to the team. As always, if you're interested in hearing Becca's first thoughts on persuasion, hanging out with us on Discord, and submitting your very own study questions, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash pod and prejudice. Now, we are so excited because we recently hit 1 million downloads of Pod and Prejudice, and we could not be more grateful to all of you. To celebrate, we're doing a giveaway of a brand new design from our Tee Public store, which I design and I think is really cute, but I'm biased. Rules for entry are on our Instagram, and we're going to pick a winner on August 2nd, so hurry up and go check it out. And now, enjoy this week's episode covering chapters 6 and 7 of Persuasion. This is Becca. This is Molly. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically to talk about persuasion. persuasion. I guess that's our new intro. Yeah, we're working on it. I, <laughs> let's workshop some stuff. Listeners, if you're new here, I, Becca, have read many of Jane Austen's novels through my life. And I, Molly, am reading her for the first time through this podcast. If you want to hear Molly read through Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, or Emma for the first time, you can listen to seasons one, two, and three of this podcast respectively, but that is not what we're doing here today. No, today we are talking about Persuasion, Volume 1, Chapters 6 and 7. Oh, boy. <laughs> You know, this is, I, I mean, without giving too much away, I think this is a perfect example of, like, basically how much of this book is going to be panicking over your ex. Yes, it is a lot of ex panicking. And, I mean, I love it. I live for it. Oh, same. She's a relatable queen. I really love her. Let's tell the listeners where we left off. Oh, yes. So where we left off is that we're in one that got away territory in terms of romantic tropes. Anne was persuaded. It's in the title. It's in the title. Away from accepting a proposal from the love of her life, Captain Wentworth, eight years ago. Since then, she has been sad and refused other proposals and basically kind of like resigned herself to no marriage. Uh, she then goes to visit her sister at Uppercross instead of going to Bath. So she is procrastinating going to Bath by hanging with Mary, Mary's husband, Charles Musgrove, their children, and Charles's family, the Musgroves, a boisterous, wealthy family that is lower class than the Elliots, but also kind of a vibe. <laughs> Speaking of being lower class than the Elliots, I wanted to bring this up because so many people messaged us about this. Um, but I just want to draw attention to the fact that uh, we hear you. The Elliots are not nobility. Someone sent us a very detailed description of what the Elliots are. And I think it's important. This is from Mandy, so thank you, Mandy. A baronet is the lowest inheritable rank in the English monarchy, meaning that the title will actually pass on to the next generation, unlike a knight such as Sir William in Pride and Prejudice. It also was a purchased inheritable title and did not get you a seat in the House of Lords because, I believe, you were still technically a commoner. Just like it was foolish for Sir William to sell his business and be like, I'm an important person now, so I don't have to work because he was noticed by the crown for some random good thing. The Elliots are just about barely nobility. Sir Walter's complete obsession with being noble is verging on the ridiculous. It also amplifies why Elizabeth would be happy with a baronet. In her mind, that's the bare minimum because it's the lowest rank with any kind of real prestige. So that was interesting to me. The title could be purchased, um, but... Otherwise, it's just about like the lowest. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rung. The, and here it says it's just about barely nobility. Someone else messaged us and said it's just below nobility. Yeah, there's a nuance here. I think the point being when we say nobility, maybe we are un like we are not being as nuanced as we should be with our language. And yeah. so I think we can be more precise about it. But the point being, he is a guy of rank and title. He is not just a member of the landed gentry. And so. He is taking title very seriously. And I do think it is significant that he is of the lowest rank mm -hmm. possible. And the part I didn't know about is the buying of the title part, which does make sense. Yeah. But um, there is a sense that you get he's living in excess of his position because he takes his rank and title way too seriously. Totally. So I think we can be a little bit more precise and more nuanced. But the point being, and the point still stands, that there is a class rank thing going on that is separate from wealth yes um and separate from land ownership and that is a title and the title is what jane austen is making fun of <laughs> yes absolutely 
We also got a comment on Instagram from Beard Noland uh, clarifying what the levels of aristocracy are, as in nobility. And the lowest level of aristocracy in Britain at this time was a baron. So a baronet is like the highest you could be without being actual nobility. You know, this reminds me of when I was in high school because there were like eight different types of math classes you could take your senior year Mm -hmm. of high school. There was like two different types of AP Calc. There was BC Calc and AB Calc. So there was like BC Calc was the highest calculus class you could be in. That was like above college level. Then there was AB Calc and that was like freshman year college. Uh And then there was honors calculus, Uh which was just not an AP class, but like a high up. And then there was advanced calculus. And then there was calculus. That's exactly like this. And, And Jane Austen is smart for picking up on these sort of like I mean, obviously she lives in the society, but she is smart for picking up on like the most like middle people Mm -hmm. in the the system of the higher class of England Mm -hmm. and being like, that's the person who is going to be the most excited about title is the person who's in the middle. Like it's unearned. Well, it's it's almost like a new money thing because it's like there's this thing where like people of a certain rank and nobility have like a wish to hide it because it's like gauche to show your money. Mm -hmm. And it's like Sir Walter's gone in the opposite direction. So it's it's pretty interesting that. Uh, but I, I think like the point still stands that like basically like our guy Sir Walter thinks himself above the landed gentry and his title means everything to him. Yeah. And uh, is part of the reason he persuaded it's in the title his daughter away from marrying the love of her life. Um, Just saying that if that's our comparison for the nobility is calculus classes, then uh, I just want to throw out there that I was a mathlete. But I am wondering if bragging about that makes me a Sir Walter. Uh, I don't know. It might make you a Lady Catherine de Bourgh. <laughs> I, I don't know. I was in the Sir Walter version of math classes. I was fine at math. I was good enough to be in the honors calc, mm. but not good enough to be in the AP calc. I, I was in AP calc. And then when I went to college, I skipped right to calc too. I, so. I mean, great for you. I took one math class in college and it was a summer course that I took to basically Get Filler requirement. Yeah. yeah, I'm not great with the math and sciences. If you want to like have me, you know, analyze English lit or talk through like British imperial history, like I can do that for you. Good but thing we have a podcast. Exactly. Like this is why I'm not an engineer. This is why I'm a podcaster. <laughs> yes. So, all right. Where were we? Because we got, we had to get into that and I'm glad we did. Um, we are at the beginning. We are at the very beginning. So, so let's get into it then. Um, Anne knows that a change in location will often include a change of conversation topics, opinions, etc. And she often, whenever she visits Upper Cross, finds herself thinking that she wishes that her other family could see how little they are of consequence to the people of Upper Cross because they have their own things to worry about. But this time she's a little bummed because she was like, well, we're kind of going through a lot right now and they don't seem to care that much they're like oh your sister and and father are in bath where do you think they're gonna settle in bath we should go to bath I love bath let's go to bath and then they like don't actually care like how she's feeling about it and she's like you know what in the future I'm just not gonna expect much from them she's gonna avoid such self-delusion and she's grateful that she has a friend in Lady Russell at least who cares about how she's feeling She figures that every community will have its own interests, and she hopes that in the course of the two months that she is staying at Upper Cross, that she will prove herself to be a worthy member of their society. Yeah, you get the sense from this portion that Anne has not done a huge amount of time away from home before, Mm -hmm. and that she's settling into something alien and new. And also, I mean... We've talked about this before, but Anne is just like a profoundly lonely figure. She is so lonely and so willing to overlook her own feelings. Yes. That and comes that, up a lot in these chapters. Yes. And sometimes to great, great comedic timing. Yes. <laughs> so she has nothing to worry about, she feels, for these two months, at this time anyway, uh, because Mary's a better sister than Elizabeth. The cottage is comfortable. It says that there's nothing inimical to to her comfort, uh, inimical meaning tending to obstruct or harm. And she likes Charles well enough. And the kids respect her more than they respect their own mom. So like she's set, she thinks at this time. 
in terms of Charles, she has no regrets uh, with not <laughs> accepting his proposal. <laughs> Like he's fine, Charlie. I I like Charlie. He's oh boy, he's like very mid. He is so funny. He he and Mary are both just hilarious. He's great. I mean, he's very much like in some ways he's almost like a sitcom dad. Oh, a hundred percent. He's like oh, uh, the kid is sick. Oh no. He's like, I don't really want to do much. I just want to hunt with my dogs. I want to hang out with the bros. Yeah, there's like, there's like a, there's an old ball and chain sort of vibe to the marriage between Charles and Mary. Yeah, and they respect each other well enough. Um, overall, or actually, it's more they mention that they give the appearance of being a happy couple. Yeah, I think there's there's worse couples in Jane Austen for sure than Charles and Mary. They, yeah, they don't despise each other. They have kids. They seem like they have a pretty comfy life together. But boy, do they annoy each other. They really get on each other's <laughs> nerves. It's I can't wait to see them in an adaptation and see like what's what's done with them. The, the rest of this chapter or a good chunk of this chapter is just what do Charles and Mary argue about? And what do they complain to Anne about while she's here? I think the very specific thing that's happening in this chapter is that everyone knows Anne's there and Anne has been the earpiece for everyone to just talk shit about each other. Yeah, because they live, they all live together on the same land. And so how are they going to talk shit when they don't have anyone to talk shit to except each other? So now Anne's there and they're like a third party. And also because Anne's a mediator between Mary and the Musgroves. Yes. Like the Musgroves whine to her about Mary and Mary whines to her about the Musgroves. And it's Anne and like she just sits there and like takes it and is like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. That um, sucks. <laughs> poor Anne. Um, yes. So let's hear what they what they argue about. Um, they need more money. They wish that his father would give them a generous gift. And Mary's salty about this, but Charles is like, well, he it's his money. Like, he has better things to do with it. He can do with it what he wants. They both think that the other person is a bad parent. Uh, and they complain about this to Anne. Uh, I have something written here, funniest quote on page 42, so I might read that at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but just complaining about being bad parents. Mary complains that Mrs. Musgrove always wants the kids to come to the great house and she just feeds them sweets all the time. And Mrs. Musgrove complains that the kids are spoiled and troublesome and she can only control them by feeding them cake. And so she doesn't invite them over as much as she's sure that Mary wants her to. So they're just like completely missing the point. My favorite part of this is it really does capture the feeling of like everyone talking shit to you about each other. Yes. Which is delicious. Yes. Like, don't get me wrong. Anne seems to think like, oh, there's too much gossip going on. Shut up, Anne. <laughs> you know you'd like it. This is fun. <laughs> um, Is Mary a neglectful mother? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad there was no thought time at all. It is wild. So, I mean, listen, Mary and Charles, their children are fed, watered, and loved, which is nice. But Mary just like has no patience for her children and seems to have no patience to do quite a anything ever. she's like go watch tv she's an icon so she, her children are ipad kids basically yes. like hardcore not being like stimulated by their mother and that's the criticism that she's getting and it's hard to even like really figure out exactly who the villain is in their lives except that like charles and mary clearly like as we'll learn do not care enough about their children <laughs> yeah but i think you understand that Anne's like a doting aunt who loves her nephews, that the children seem overall to be good kids, even though yes. they're kind of wild children a little bit. Yeah. Um, so like no one's no one's in harm's way. No. But oh boy, yeah. Mary is just like not she, she mentions that like she can't stand to be around her children. Yeah. She later will say something like, I can't take care of this kid. I I can't yell at him when he's sick. So what am I gonna do? It's also like towards the beginning when she's like, Oh, I'm so sick. And I'm all alone. And Anne's like, where are your children? And she's like, like I sent them away. Yeah, I couldn't handle them. I couldn't deal with them. Something else that I noticed, this is the first time I've seen this in a Jane Austen, so I don't know uh, if it's normal, but Mrs. Musgrove calls Mary Mrs. Charles, like Mrs. First Name. I have no idea. I hated like, it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the whole tension here, your understanding of the tension here is that Mr. Musgrove is the gentleman at Upper Cross. And his son will inherit that position, but as of right now, has not yet inherited. And so they're in this like awkward in between where like 
there is a knowledge of who will be the gentleman of Upper Cross and his wife. And Mary thinks that gives her a certain amount of panache. Mm -hmm. And the Musgroves are uncomfy with how much Mary knows that. Oh. She kept talking about her place. Yep. And I was thinking she meant as the daughter of a baronet. Part of it's, yeah, she she does think she requires some prestige as the daughter of a baronet. But it is also like Charles will inherit. Mary will inherit mm -hmm. as his wife. And she wants that to be clear to everyone. But Mrs. Musgrove are like, we're here. Like, it's that uncomfortable thing where if a child says something like, oh, God, I can't wait for my inheritance to come through. It's like, well, what has to happen for that inheritance to come through? Yeah, right. It's like, like we're still alive. Mr. Musgrove is still the gentleman of Uppercross. Yeah. Like, he is still the head of that house. And Mary, you are not yet. So chill. Yeah. Another thing that Mary complains about is that Mrs. Musgrove's servants are always gadding, which means gallivanting about town, um, always hanging in her nursery and trying to get her servant, Jemima, to walk with them. Meanwhile, Mrs. Musgrove is complaining to Anne that Mary's servant, Jemima, is, quote, always upon the gad, which, similar to gallivanting, just carefree adventure, like not doing her job, and that she dresses too nice and ruins other servants, which I feel like means makes them aspire to have more than they do, which feels weird. I mean, yeah, the whole thing is a little weird. I mean, we recall we're in a Jane Austen novel where yeah, the servants yeah, yeah, are yeah, not yeah. treated very nicely. I I read this as also just like a your floozy is encouraging my servants to become floozies situation. Yes. And they both think that about the other persons. And and meanwhile, the servants are probably all friends and like, leave us alone. Exactly. And Anne's just sitting there taking it all in while she sips a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Then we have Mary complaining that Mrs. Musgrove doesn't give her her due as both a daughter of a baronet and future lady of the house. But one of the sisters, one of Charles's sisters, complains to Anne that Mary is nonsensical about her place in society. And she knows that Mary's nonsensical about it because Anne is so indifferent to her own place and they're related. She wishes that someone would tell Mary to stop trying to take Mrs. Musgrove's place at dinner parties, specifically. She's like, I know that she will be one day and that it is her right to have a place in our house. but. Who it's, cares? It's it's also just like stop acting like it and stop being so um like stop begging for it basically. Stop doing it because like there's like an emotional intelligence level to it, like yeah. a propriety thing where it's like, let Mrs. Musgrove be Mrs. Musgrove. She's still here. Right. You're just Mrs. Charles. Exactly. But Anne, of course, through all of this, can do nothing but smile and nod. Other than that, though, the visit is going well. Mary is feeling better. They visit with the family every morning and every night and play some music. Anne plays better than most of the Musgrove girls, but, quote, having no voice, no knowledge of the harp, and no fond parents to sit by and fancy themselves delighted. Her performance was thought little of. Oh, which I thought was funny. Well, Anne has such a nobody understands me vibe. Yeah. But also, like, what is it with Jane Austen just deciding, like, quiet women are always good at piano? They need something to do with their time. Yeah. Yeah. What's devastating, though, is that she's used to playing only for her own pleasure and not for anyone else's because, quote, accepting one short period of her life, which I assume is the period in Wentworth. which Wentworth, <laughs> in which she knew Wentworth. She had never since the age of 14, never since the loss of her mother, known the happiness of being listened to or encouraged by any just appreciation or real taste. Molly's literally crying, guys. It's sad. Like, nobody ever listens to her except for when she was with Wentworth and he listened to her play. And he listened to her. Yeah. In general. Yeah. Nobody cares about Anne. No. Yeah, I know. Like you said, Anne, the classic middle child. Like... Yeah, and she just, she doesn't allow herself to feel these feelings. Like, she notices them, which is, like, kind of zen of her. But she notices them, and they pass through her. And then she's like, but I'm happy that the Musgroves are enjoying their own daughter's playing. Well, also, I mean, you get the idea that, like, she plays. And they're not appreciating the like, exquisite nature of her music. But the Musgrove girls love to dance. So they like that Anne likes to play so that they can dance. Yes, because after every dinner party, they and they have company a lot, like, the girls devolve into dancing and Anne plays and they're like, look at your fingers fly across the keyboard. So it's like when it serves the greater group, 
it's definitely appreciated. I think it's more like you have some beautiful Joni Mitchell that you want to play at a party and everyone's like, can you play Kesha or yeah. like, okay, it's like no, anyway, you know what? here's Wonderwall. You know, he, actually, I'm going to I'm going to cancel that because Kesha is great. I'm not going to poo poo on Kesha. We love Kesha. We love Kesha. So like it's kind of like asking about top 40 hits. Yeah, well, they just want they want dancing music. They don't want to hear her playing Chopin or whatever. Like Exactly. They just want the like the fun stuff to dance to. But they do love her playing and she likes to play. So it kind of works out. But she doesn't get the chance to like luxuriate in the more beautiful. Yeah. Piano. If they're sitting around and playing for each other. They want to hear their daughters playing the harp and singing and, you know, they love the harp, this family. That comes up later, but they do love the harp. So anyway, three weeks pass and Michaelmas happens. And suddenly it is September 29th, which is the day that the Crofts are coming to take over Kellynch Hall. And Anne is feeling some type of way about it. Mary is like, Ugh, I don't want to go visit them, but I have to. So she gets Charles to drive her over. And when she comes back, she is in, quote, a comfortable state of imaginary agitation. Is that just her being annoyed further about having to have gone? Yeah, yeah, I okay. think so. Yeah. They don't tell us much about what happened when she went over there. Well, I think for her, it's like, oh, God, this terrible thing has happened to me. Yeah, and Anne's like, you didn't even live there. <laughs> exactly. It had no effect on your life in a material manner. Yeah, except for that now you get your sister to hang out with you for two months. Exactly. Anne was glad that there had been no means of her going. Do they not have... A carriage large enough for three people. Yes. So, okay. So they're like, that's just another status thing. Like, they don't have, what is it, a barouche? Yeah, they do not have a barouche. Got it. Look Um, at that. Look at that. (laughs) They don't have a barouche Landau. They do not have a barouche Landau. They have a, um, they have a carriage, but I think not large enough for all of them to go. Mm -hmm. And Anne was like, oh, no. Oh, no. So sad. I can't go. So sad. (laughs) (laughs) Which is the theme of Anne in these chapters. Literally. Yeah. The Crofts return the visit to Mary when it's just Mary and Anne home. And Mrs. Croft sits by Anne and Mr. Croft sits by Mary. And Anne, through the whole conversation, is trying to find a resemblance between Mrs. Croft and her brother. Mrs. Croft is square, upright, and vigorous. She has an agreeable face, good teeth, but she's weather-beaten, as she has been at sea almost as much as her husband. She looks older than her 38 years. But she has very agreeable manners. She's very self-assured. And Anne is feeling great. She's like, there is absolutely no suspicion on the part of Mrs. Croft. Everything's going great. And then Mrs. Croft is like, it was you and not your sister, I find, that my brother had the pleasure of being acquainted with when he was in this country. And Anne is like, fuck. There, the panic Anne feels in this scene is so palpable. Yes. Like, it's it's so good because she's just like, um, yeah, I, yeah. Um. <laughs> and then she says, perhaps you may not have heard that he is married. And in my notes, I was like, no. Well, in Anne's head, she says, no. And she like has this internal panic. Yeah. Which is hilarious for so many reasons. For some reason, there's nothing funnier to me than someone internally panicking about an ex without anybody else knowing about it. Yeah. She's just like smiling like. "Mm." Maybe it's because I've been there. Like we've all been there where like someone brings up someone you have history with and the person bringing it up doesn't know you have history with the person. And you're just like, um. Yeah, that person is cool and exists. I hear that they have a dog. <laughs> and and some teeth. They have a face. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But the next words that Mrs. Croft speaks explain it to be Mr. Wentworth, of whom she spoke, and not Captain Wentworth. So the curate brother. Yes. Who tricked us all in chapter three. Right. Now, my first read through of this, I was like, yes, great few my second read through I panicked and I was like what if she's still misunderstanding she's not because we realized that later in the chapters but I had to I just had to say that I went down a whole rabbit hole I was like I'm not convinced no 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 it is definitely uh Mr. Wentworth which again makes this very funny as a scene yes it's just like the emotional whiplash of Anne being like oh yeah I did I did know your brother no he's married oh god you're just talking about the other brother of course you are that was my neighbor 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But like, it, do you ever have that situation where it's like, if I tell you not to think of an elephant, what are you going to think about? An elephant. So like, I feel like Anne is trying really hard to not think about Captain Wentworth in the context of the Crofts, but like she can't help herself. So in her mind, like everything is tainted by Captain Wentworth. Yeah. And so instead, everyone else is like chill. And they're like, oh, you have these acquaintances. We have like a lot in common. We're from the same neighborhood. And she's just like, Captain Wentworth, Captain Wentworth, Freddy, 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 Freddy. Yeah. Then the Admiral says that they're expecting a brother of Mrs. Crofts to visit soon. Quote, I dare say you know him by name. But she he says that to Mary. But like in her mind, she's like, <laughs> what do you mean? She's like, wait, is this, is this one Edward as well? No, says, that, that one might be Fred. She's like, no, it has to be Edward. It has to be Edward. It has to be Edward. Oh, my God. Their names are Eddie and Freddie. Eddie and Freddie. Oh, wow. But before he can say more about it, he's interrupted by the boys, uh, the young Musgroves, coming in, begging him not to leave and saying, can you take me away in your pocket? It's so cute. We we haven't really touched on it, but you get a little like environmental like scene setting about who the Crofts are as people, yeah. Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft. I love them. Yeah, they're just so chill. And like you get the sense Admiral Croft has been like roughhousing with the boys on yeah, the ground. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, someone's acting like they like us. Someone's playing with us and not just going out and shooting with his dogs. We're not on our iPads for once. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I love them. Anyway, they go to the great house and Anne is left still trying to convince herself that they're talking about Edward and not Freddie. But we know as the readers, <laughs> we as the readers know that they are. So later, the folks of the great house, uh, the Musgroves are supposed to be coming over in the carriage, but Louisa, one of the sisters, comes in on foot, and Mary is all ready to be up in arms about, like, are you coming to tell us you're not coming anymore? And she's like, no, no, I only came on foot to make room for the harp in the carriage because Mama and Papa are out of spirits, particularly Mama, because she is thinking of poor Richard. And I was like, who? And the harp makes her feel better. We're going to learn about poor Richard in a second. Louisa talks about the visit from the Crofts and confirms that it is Captain Wentworth who is coming to see them directly. Oh, yes. And I'm sure you saw that coming because it wouldn't be a book if we didn't see Captain Wentworth. Can you imagine if the whole book was just like, maybe Captain Wentworth is going to show up and he never does and we're waiting for Captain Wentworth? Well, because I was reading chapter by chapter by this point in time, I was like, where's Captain Wentworth? So I was like, I was impatient. But because we're moving at the pace we're moving, like, you've met Captain by this point, but it, it is very funny that like she has this like, oh, maybe it is going to be his brother, the married curate and not Captain Wentworth, the swashbuckling sea captain who stole my heart eight <laughs> years ago. Swashbuckling. Uh, he's just dashing. He really is. I, I already know. Mm. So when Wentworth was brought up, Mrs. Musgrove got all in her head. She was like, Wentworth was the name of poor Richard's captain a while before he died. And so she goes through all his letters and she's like, yes, it was Captain Wentworth and it must be the same one. Now, we learn the real circumstances of this, quote, pathetic piece of family history. And also just like Jane really fucked up here for a little minute. I need to. I'm just going to read it. Yeah, you just have to. So this is their other son, the Musgrove's other son besides Charles. Here we go. The real circumstances of this pathetic piece of family history were that the Musgroves had had the ill fortune of a very troublesome, hopeless son and the good fortune to lose him before he reached his 20th year. First of all, Jane. did he die before his 20th year or did he just go to sea before his 20th year? He died. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um that he had been sent to the sea because he was stupid and unmanageable on shore, that he had been very little cared for at any time by his family, though quite as much as he deserved, seldom heard of, and scarcely at all regretted when the intelligence of his death abroad had worked its way to Uppercross two years before. Devastating for poor Richard. In fact, even though his sisters now call him poor Richard, he had been nothing better than a thick-headed, unfeeling, unprofitable Dick Musgrove who had never done anything to entitle himself to more than the abbreviation of his name, living or dead. Very harsh words from our girl Janie. But like, here's the thing. Is this what the Musgroves think of him or is this what Jane thinks of him? This is what Jane thinks of him. Devastating. Yeah. Uh, so here's here's like Jane's turn of events here to which I'm like, Jane, come now. So in her brain... What's happening is this. The Musgroves, as we've learned, very nice people, not the smartest. Yeah. Um, and they had a really ne'er-do-well son. 
And he did what a lot of ne'er-do-well sons do. He joined the Navy, died at sea. And it's one of those like hindsight is not always 2020 situations where like now that he's dead, he is like a perfect son in the eyes of Mrs. Musgrove and her darling, like who was beloved is like gone to her. But when he was alive, she fucking hated him. And Jane is like, he's actually, he was just always crap. She's like, yeah, she's mourning a piece of shit. But also Jane, (laughs) I kind of, here's my head cannon. Because they mention that he had been in those removals, which in the course of removals to which all midshipmen are liable, and especially such midshipmen as every captain wishes to get rid of, ended up on the Laconia with Captain Wentworth. My headcanon is that he was out misbehaving in the Navy and was sent to Captain Wentworth, who has a little island of misfit boys, um, all of whom were misbehaving in their previous ships. And he sets them to rights and makes them right to their families. And he ended up being a good person before he died. Okay, well, we'll, we'll give we'll give that head cannon. Thanks. You're uh, welcome. Like, I'm, I'm a fan of Dick Musgrove. R.I.P. I think that he wasn't as as bad as all that. Very tough for a guy, Dick Musgrove. Poor Richard. Poor Richard. So anyway, Wentworth encouraged him while he was on his ship to write two letters home, or at least two that were not just applications for money. Uh, He wrote two letters telling of his tales of the sea. And he had spoken well of his captain, Captain Wentworth, in his letters, but the family wasn't very observant and didn't care enough to really read the letters at the time. So when she hears the name Wentworth, Mrs. Musgrove is like, wait, that's ringing a bell. And she goes back, she reads them, and suddenly she's like, oh, poor Richard, and is grieving him more than she actually did when he died. Now, hearing everybody talking about Wentworth for going on and on and on is a trial for Anne's nerves, but one to which she must inure herself, which means accustom oneself to especially something unpleasant. I mean, yeah, like this is this is one of those things. She's been obsessively tracking his career on her own time because yeah. she's obsessed with him and she she still loves him. Of but, course. Like, I can't express how relatable it is to panic over an ex resurfacing in your life. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And to hear everyone talking about it for like 20 minutes straight and you're just like, there's something very unsettling about talking about someone who meant something very specific to you and years down the line hearing about them from someone who does not know what your relationship to that person was. It's very awkward. And so, like, Anne is the lady of the poker face. So she's immediately like, I will handle this. I will handle this. But the internal panicking that it defines these chapters for Anne. Yes. Like you feel it like you can you can understand it. It makes me think that Jane had an ex that she felt this way about because it's just so real. A hundo P. (laughs) Is that not what the kids say? Hundo P. Hundo P. Hundred percent. I mean, I understood it. It just like like intellectually, just not spiritually. Understood. Understood. (laughs) Um, Speaking of Anne being a sufferer in silence, complete side tangent. But I recently watched Am I OK? Have you seen it? No, you wanted me to watch it oh, again, yes, yes, but I yes. worked all night. <laughs> yes. So we watched it, and Dakota Johnson is in it. Is she British, by the way? No. no um, it's just very funny. I mean, Dakota Johnson coming up during this this uh, podcast is Well, funny. I'm bringing it up because I know that she is in the new adaptation mm-hmm. of Persuasion. But I was thinking about it during the movie. I was like, she's not British. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be British to be in Persuasion, but I feel like it's a British movie no I don't know no spoilers we don't know no spoilers I have more of my finger on the pulse of like the persuasion adaptation yeah. than you do and I've watched one which I will not disclose okay but it's uh it is it is a movie version. well so I went through I went through it while I was watching this movie because I was like the the premise of am I okay is that Dakota Johnson is like 30 and realizing that she's gay and having to like enter the dating scene and feels like very late and she has a lot of gay panic and so it's a lot of her like silently being like "Ah, what am I doing am I why am I so messed up and I was like I don't know if I can picture her as a Jane Austen heroine because in my mind Jane Austen heroines are like Emma and Elizabeth who are like these firecracker women who won't let anything get in their way and blah 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 blah. and then I was like oh wait She's playing Anne Elliot, which is exactly how this character is, like just completely silent panicking, 
subdued, lets people walk all over her. And I was like, okay, maybe I can see Dakota Johnson playing that role. So I'm curious to see how it goes. I know that the Austin community is very divided on this uh, adaptation. So what am I going to do? Neither confirm nor deny. I will neither confirm nor deny. So anyway, the Musgroves have read in the letters from poor Richard very warm praise of Captain Wentworth, if badly spelled. Um, <laughs> she just can't help herself. She just keeps taking shots at this dead teenager. Yeah, poor guy. He was literally only 19. Um, and they decide that they have to invite him over, Captain Wentworth, as soon as he's in town, which brings us to Chapter 7. Oh, yes. Um, and boy, does it bring us to Chapter 7. Yes. So a few days later, Captain Wentworth is at Kellynch. And Mr. Musgrove goes to call on him and invites him to dine with them at Uppercross with the Crofts in a week. And they're all upset that it's like a week. Why not sooner? And I was like, yeah, why not sooner? Are the Crofts too busy? Like, do they have such a big social life that they can't meet for another week? I was pissed. You and the Musgroves. Me and the Musgroves both. Captain Wentworth returns the visit during calling hours uh, like the next day. And Anne almost accidentally visits the great house at the same time as him. (laughs) The dance that she is doing to try to avoid her ex right now. Yes. I mean, thankfully, so she didn't know he was there at the same time, but she and Mary are on their way there when Mary's son falls, maybe off a horse. I don't know, but he's rushed home and they're like, we must go home. He's dislocated his collarbone. I think the idea is that he's playing in the like, the outside, maybe climbing a tree or something. And he falls. falls and breaks a bone as children do. Yeah. And that Mary has decided this is the end of days for her child. Yes. I mean, to be fair, it's not even broken. It's dislocated. It's popped back into place as soon as the apothecary. I know. There. No, it's it's scary. I also would be it would be the end of days. If it was me, it would be the end of days. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, we've all we've all gone through minor injuries, but children go through these sorts of things. But I, I can imagine a five-year-old child being in a lot of pain with a dislocated collarbone. Oh, no, it's it's very sad, yeah. and especially because his parents don't care about him. Um, but they do. They, but they do. They do. They, they, do. they over panic. And bless her. My mom does this sometimes when I get stressed or upset. She, like, amplifies the stress and upset, which makes everything worse. So it's like... That that's what I see happening here. Anne is this calming presence where she's like, oh, my God, let's get a doctor. Let's make sure he's OK. Let's make sure there's no spinal damage because otherwise it's going to be he'll like be fine. And Mary's like, my child is dying and like going absolutely insane. So there is this like immediate panic. But once they realize he's not dying, yes, they like completely go indifferent. Yeah, <laughs> just so yes. sad. It is sad. So the apothecary comes, pops the collarbone back into place. And before they leave, the young Musgrove ladies tell Anne how handsome Captain Wentworth was, how agreeable, how much he exceeded their expectations, and how he will be coming to dine with them tomorrow. I'm like, what happened to a week? Well, maybe he had a really good time. Mm, And he was like, okay, sure, I'll come. Oh, no. (laughs) Molly, what's going on in your brain? (laughs) He said maybe he had a really good time, and at the end of this chapter... They say that he's trying to get married and then he has his eyes from the Musgrove girls. And I was like, maybe that's just Jane like messing with us. But what if he actually does? (laughs) What if he's coming to dine with them tomorrow because he enjoyed hanging out with the young Musgrove ladies? Fuck. Molly's Molly's on the verge of tears, everyone. I was not expecting that. All right. We don't know. But he's... (laughs) He's coming tomorrow. Um, first, they invited him to stay tonight. And he was like, oh, I can't, but I could tomorrow. So he comes. He's coming tomorrow. And then the girls. Oh, my God. And in my notes, even I was like, they have these huge crushes on him. The two girls. I was like, of course, all the ladies have crushes on him. They run off full of glee and love. Apparently more full of Captain Wentworth than of little Charles, which is, again, sad because he's <laughs> his like five-year-old child is on a bed like like dislocated collarbone like massive pain and his aunts come by and they're like there was a hot guy oh no he was really hot <laughs> that night they all come back and mr musgrove confirms that captain worth is in fact awesome and he's only sorry that the cottage party, Mary Charles Anne, won't be able to leave little Charles to join the visit tomorrow. And Anna's like, yeah, that's really too bad. Oh, God. 
I mean, yeah, Anne's like, oh no, I have to put it off a little longer. Yeah. She's she's going to do anything she can to not see him. Later, little Charles is doing better and Charles, big Charles, <laughs> I'm going to call them big C and little C. Big C and little C. Um, big C is like, the boy's doing well. I want to meet Captain Wentworth. Maybe I won't dine with them, but I'll just swing by for half an hour. Like, it'll be fine. And Mary's like, no, I can't have you go away at all. What if something happens? And the next day, little C is, in fact, doing much better. And Charles is like, no, my work here is done. Uh, It says, what was there for a father to do? This was quite a female case. And it would be highly absurd in him, who could be of no use at home, to shut himself up. I mean, poor on Jane for this, but also poor on Charles for this. Poor on Charles for this. At least Mary understands that this isn't okay. Does she, though? Because I feel like Mary's just mad that she's not going. Well, she is. (laughs) She is. But first, she's mad that he's going. And Anne is like, this is the mother's duty. And Mary is like, well, he always does this. He always gets out of things as soon as they get tough. So... Here he is to go away and enjoy himself. And because I am the poor mother, I am not allowed to stir. Okay, yeah, I guess it it is more that she's upset that she's not going on. Yeah. Yeah. But she points out that she's the least fit of all of them to take care of children because she yesterday when he got injured, she was hysterical. This is why I love Mary. She's a fucking disaster. Yeah. She's like, look at me. I can't take care of a child. I'm a mess. Look at I'm just a baby. I'm baby. (laughs) She's like a young Mrs. Bennett in terms of like my poor nerves, but she cares less about her kids. She's like an indifferent Mrs. Bennett mixed with a Mr. Woodhouse. Yeah. Cause, yes. Because it's that it's that like level of hypochondria and like worry mixed with a desire to be out in society. Yes. Which is like Mary's a phenomenon. I like she's not a great person, but, but she's I love like her. potentially one of my favorite characters. Yeah. In the book. I know. I really love her. Anne points out that. She was hysterical yesterday because of the shock, but she's going to be fine today. And Mary's like, I'm of no more use in a sick room than Charles. I just end up yelling at the kids and scolding them. And like, that's not helpful. At least she's aware of that. And Anne's like, well, would you be comfortable spending a whole evening away from the kid? And she says, well, if Charles can, why can't I? Jemima will be fine. And she says, I was dreadfully alarmed yesterday, but the case is very different today. Basically, exactly contradicting what she had just said and saying what Anne said in response. And so Anne is like, I have an idea. Why don't you leave Charles, Lil C, with me and you can go to dinner? And Mary's like, that's a great idea. (laughs) You're the better caretaker anyway. And you can send for us if anything goes wrong. So Mary goes to Charles to tell him that Anne is going to stay with Lil C. And Big C is like, well, that's very nice of Anne. But isn't it kind of shitty to make your sister stay home and care for our child? And Anne is like, no, 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 it's fine. (laughs) And Charles is like, well, why don't you come once Lil C is in bed for the night? And Anne is unpersuadable. It's in the title. Yes. And Um, growth. For being unpersuadable instead of persuadable. But it's also just one of those things where it's like, oh, are you sure? You're good. Like, it's, I feel bad. I feel bad. Yes. And Anne's like, no, it's really like, literally, don't. it's fine. <laughs> She's like, you're helping me avoid my ex. It's fine. Yeah. But poor Anne is left with as many sensations of comfort as were perhaps ever likely to be hers. What was it to her if Frederick Wentworth were only half a mile distant, making himself agreeable to others? Anne. Anne. You're not fooling literally anybody. She wishes she knew how he felt about their potential meeting. She thinks that he is indifferent. No, definitely not. She thinks that if he wanted to see her, he would have sought her out a long time ago after he gained his independence, which I think is a classic misunderstanding. They both think the other person doesn't want them because they didn't reach out. This is exactly like the notebook. I brought the notebook up last time, but like I wrote you 365 days. I wrote you 365 letters. I wrote you every day for a year. And she's like, like she could have written. She could have picked up a pen. She could have found him. And she didn't. And he thought that she hated him. And she thought that he hated her. And neither of them wrote. Neither of them sought each other out. Nope. She just social media stalked him for like eight years. She thought that was, she can't, you know what? She can't say she thought that was what was best for him because she didn't even try. Ugh, I'm mad at her. (laughs) And you're not the only one. Yeah. So the Musgroves come back raving about Captain Wentworth and saying that he's coming to shoot the next morning with Charles. But somehow in the planning of things, 
they were supposed to have breakfast before, but it ended up that they're going to go have breakfast first at the great house and not at the cottage um, because he didn't want to be in the way of Mary and the child. And I was like, is he avoiding her? And Anne's like, he's avoiding me. A hundred percent. Yeah. The next morning when Mary and Anne are starting breakfast, Charles comes by. They've already had breakfast and he's going to grab his dogs and go shoot. And his sisters and Captain Wentworth are following behind and Anne is like, fuck, 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 fuck. And this is the worst because it's like when you go to a party or something and you know your ex is going to be there, you get to like doll up a little bit. You get to like, like prep yourself. But like a sneak attack while you're having breakfast in the morning. Like you just woke up. Your hair's a mess. <sighs> Nightmare. Nightmare scenario. But also, she doesn't... What what confuses me is... So, he comes by, and he stays for two minutes to talk to Mary while Charles grabs the dogs. Anne does not stay in the room, but rather, what I read is that she stands outside, peeks in, catches his eye, he bows, she curtsies, and then he leaves. Like, she, instead of... Just being a normal fucking person nope. <laughs> and staying in the room to greet him and just like trying to be normal. She runs away and stands in the corner. Let's reread that that little section real quick, because I, I think it's very telling. Mary, very much gratified by this attention, was delighted to receive him while a thousand feelings rushed on Anne, of which this was the most consoling, that it would soon be over. And it was soon <laughs> over. <laughs> In the two minutes after Charles's preparation, the others appeared. They were in the drawing room. Her eye half met Captain Wentworth's about a curtsy past. She heard his voice. He talked to Mary, said all that was right, said something to the Miss Musgroves, enough to mark an easy footing. The room seemed full, full of persons and voices, but a few minutes ended it. So I don't know if she was outside the room. She might not have been outside the room. No. It I, was more that she like, yeah, I guess she caught his eye, but she didn't say anything. She was no. just like, there he is. Hello curtsy okay so she wasn't hiding it's it's like a little like shake wave yeah at least like, she didn't run away no she, she did not run away she but she did have a moment of like complete clam up yeah and this girl like a thousand feelings rushes through her when she realizes that he's coming oh and 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 she is in full panic mode she's like not at all present mary is talking to her about him and she's just over and over thinking, like, I've seen him. We've met. It's over. It's over. The, the worst is done. But she didn't do a very good job at it. Just saying. She thinks that she should be feeling less since eight years have passed. But, quote, alas, with all her reasonings, she found that to retentive feelings, eight years may be little more than nothing. <sighs> oh, girl. Girl. That's pining. This is a pining book. Like that, that is dedicated and committed pining. Can you imagine pining for someone for eight years? Sure. <laughs> you know me. No, I mean, I mean, we've all, we all have, we all have. Um, it's, it's a painful experience. Yes, it, it is. I cannot imagine what that could do to a person. Of course it could age you. She proceeds to overthink thinking what is he feeling is he avoiding her why is she overthinking why am i why am i spiraling well, another really important thing i think we didn't touch on yet is that captain wentworth is looking he looks exactly the same no i mean he's aging like fine wine yes. he, time has only made him hotter exactly and richer yes which is so devastating when you see your ex like you don't necessarily want them to be doing badly but you want them to be doing a little worse than you yes i hope you're happy but not like how you were with me in the words of Olivia Rodrigo. Oh, I was going to go with, I hope you're happy, but I'm, that I'm happy first. Yeah. Well, that, that's, it's, I hope you're happy, but not like how you were with me and selfish. I know I can't let you go. Find someone great, but don't find no one better. I hope you're happy. All right. Let's not pay for the song. Yeah. yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but that's the general gist of things is like, she's like, fuck, he's doing better than me. He's hot. He's so hot. Yeah. She's like, wow. Okay. Not only have I like rightfully been in love with him for eight years since I refused him, but now he's rich and hot in a way that he wasn't before. This is devastating. And then Henrietta returns and she says something that I also need to read. Yes. Henrietta says, Captain Wentworth is not very gallant by you, Anne. Oh, is this Henrietta? No, no this it's is, Mary. Because this is Mary. Who else could be that tactless? Oh, my God. Mary. Oh, Jesus. She says, Captain Wentworth is not very gallant by you, Anne, though he was so attentive to me. Henrietta asked him what he thought of you when they went away. And he said, you were so altered that he should not have known you again. Whew. First of all, 
it takes a sister with like zero to negative tact to say that to you. Like, can you imagine disclosing that to another person? Why would you ever? Oh, my God. And also just like, can you imagine a worse thing to hear from someone you're in love with? No, truly devastating. She her response is that the years that had destroyed her youth and bloom had only given him a more glowing, manly, open look in no respect, lessening his personal advantages. She had seen the same Frederick Wentworth. Meanwhile, he is like, who the fuck was that? Wow. Hag. She she really let herself go. Yeah. Oh, Oh. oh. and she's just like so devastated. But at the same time, her first thought is, okay, he thinks I'm aged and altered beyond recognition. This is good. This will help me get over him, which is Delulu. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, this is this is the ticket you needed to get over Captain Wentworth. Yeah. Yeah. is, Is him being an asshole to you. In the next paragraph, I I was wondering if this is Anne's thoughts on the subject or if it's the actual truth. And the more I read, the more I think that maybe it's the actual truth, which is just really hard. Um, But basically, it says that he has not forgiven her. He thinks that she is wretchedly altered, that she used him ill, deserted him, which she did. She betrayed him. He thinks that she has a feebleness of character for having given him up to oblige others, a consequence of over-persuasion. It's, it's in the title. title. He had been attracted to her once, but now he has no desire to ever see her again. Devastating. Yeah, that 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 right there is a Jane Austen turning to the camera moment. I can't. I really thought this was going to go a different way. Oh, Molly. I thought that he was going to be pining for her, too. But instead, he's just mad. Oh, I mean, and we'll, there's a lot to talk about here with the yes. study questions, and we'll get into it. But... Can you blame him? No, not at all. I would be pissed too. Yeah, that's like kind of the thing. It's like, I don't want to uh, condone the use of the the discussion of women in this regard in any way, because it is not nice. And it's pretty cruel to call a woman sort of wretched beyond her years or age beyond recognition. Yeah. It's a bit of a sexist uh, insult. Yeah, actually the whole, it's all a little bit sexist with like, she is just like, Gone. The years have taken her bloom away from her while he's just gotten more and more handsome after yeah. this terrible thing happened to them. But I think it's a little bit symbolic and we can get to it in the study questions. Oh, yeah. I think there's a lot to unpack about what happened to Wentworth versus what happened to Anne during that eight year stint apart. Yeah. Um, but we learn Wentworth is on the market. He is looking to fall in love. And his sister puts it delicately like he is like not picky. <laughs> Yeah, well, she says that he's not picky. He says, well, he, his response to her, I read as sarcasm. He was like, yes, here I am, Sophia, quite ready to make a foolish match. Anybody between 15 and 30 may have me for asking. A little beauty and a few smiles and a few compliments to the Navy and I'm a lost man. Should this not be enough for a sailor who has had no society among women to make him nice? A little bit of sarcasm. Yeah. A little, little hint of truth, though. I, it, there's a little hint of truth, but at the same time, like, Anne is still his golden standard, I think, because it says that um, Anne Elliot was not out of his thoughts. When he more seriously described the woman he should wish to meet with, a strong mind with sweetness of manner was the first and last of the description. So, like, it says that she's still the person that she was is still his golden standard. Yes. But is he looking for love? No, he's looking to get married. He's not looking for love. I think that he oh, (laughs) I think that he has given up on love because he had his great love. And she took his heart and stomped on it until there was blood everywhere. Oh, and he says, well, love's not for me. I just need to get married. Well, I'll neither confirm or deny that. Sad. Anyway, that's the end of the chapter. And what a reunion that was, which brings us to our patron study questions. Well, I also want to add that it says that he... I think that he's he's going to be a little bit picky. He says something a little inferior. I shall, of course, put up with, but it must not be much. I, if I am a fool, I shall be a fool indeed, for I have thought on the subject more than most men. So I think that he's not going to take someone who he like I'm, I am. I'm torn on whether he is trying to find love or not based on that last paragraph. It's really hard to tell what he wants out of a marriage, isn't it? Yeah, I think partially because he's guarded and so he's not going to tell his sister what he wants. He's quietly, he's been quite hurt before. Yeah. And he's also been at sea for a long time. So he's lonely. He knows he is a much better catch than he used to be. Yeah. 
Does he want companionship? Does he want security in an economic match that would be very good for him? Economics of dating in Jane Austen. Hello, Graham, the sound effect. Does he want love like he found with Anne with another person? Like, it's not clear from what he's saying here. All we know is that he is looking for a marriage. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Wentworth. Okay. So that is the end of chapter seven. Which brings us to our patron study questions. I'm actually going to go a little out of order and sprinkle in patron study questions with Becca's study questions so we can go chronologically through what we've done so far. Sure. So I'm going to start with one of Becca's study questions, which is how does Jane Austen teach us about Anne through these chapters? One thing I noticed about Anne in these chapters was that she is so quick to ignore her own feelings and brush over them. It happened several times where like she had a feeling and then was like, but it's okay because, and then like moved on from that feeling. So she's got a lot going on that she's ignoring. And that also like when we see how many things are constantly bombarding her, like people being like, Anne is a neutral third party that I could just like dump on um it shows like why she's kind of quiet because she's like just taking things in and never putting things out and also just like putting out fires all the time um and having to be that constant calm peacekeeper yeah i think these chapters give a great impression of how exhausting it is to be an elliot yeah because she is again so internal and we'll we'll get into that a little bit but there's the way in which the chap- these chapters operate you see her taking a bunch of people talking shit. Uh, you see her constantly playing ref between the Musgroves and her sister. You see her take care of her sister's sick child. And you see her basically like performing the emotional labor for every single person around her when she is the one who just lost her home. Mm-hmm. And I think what Austin is showing us rather than telling us through these chapters is the kind of person Anne is, which is unspeakably selfless yeah like so selfless so concerned with the wants and needs of others so self-sacrificing at every turn and she makes the ultimate self-sacrifice yeah and she's she's sort of quiet and sturdy and to learn about Anne is to learn through her actions towards others while also knowing what's going on in the back of her head because none of these people know what it was like for her to lose her home. And none of these people know that she is about to see the man that she rejected eight years ago um, because none of them were privy to that. So Austin breaks our hearts for Anne by just showing us how much she does for other people at her own expense mm-hmm. constantly. Absolutely. And I think the Musgroves, despite like the, I, I do like the Musgroves as characters. I yeah. think they, they're kind people. And like, I think they're, they're meant to be likable, but they also, make her feel quite alone and quite burdened yeah not so much as her father and her older sister but still you know like that that's just her natural state of affairs totally so very sad and this connects to emily's study question emily our patron which says Anne has very few confidants in the book so far how does that change how we learn about her and her hopes yeah i mean what are her hopes even like i feel like she doesn't (laughs) she has hopes but she quashes them So she doesn't actually like hope for much for herself. It's interesting to say that she has few confidants because she has so many people talking to her all the time, but she doesn't actually get to confide in them. And her one confidant being Lady Russell doesn't want to talk about Wentworth with her. So that's devastating. It also changes like the way that we learn about her because we don't actually get to see like how she expresses herself we only get to see how she internalizes things and kind of quashes things before they even make it out of her mouth Mm -hmm. like we see how she behaves in the world um, but we don't get to see her actually like express her feelings to anybody so it's quite sad yeah it's, it's all it's a very internal book in that way like Emma has her moments of internal uh, reflection, as does Lizzie Bennet. And Lizzie's kind of giving herself little sassy asides. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Emma is talking herself into the Lulu concepts constantly. Anne is rationalizing away really intense feelings all the time. It's almost like she is like, it's been a while since Sense and Sensibility, but I feel like Eleanor, um, they're they're very similar, except that... Eleanor, I don't think we got a lot of her internal monologue, so we didn't know 
what she was thinking as much as we do know what Anne is thinking. Well, the, there's a big difference between Eleanor and Anne in that Anne is so much older than Eleanor. What's, what's sort of remarkable about Eleanor as a character is how young she is, how how much she has to take on at such a ripe age of 19. <laughs> yeah, which is so insane yeah. to think about. Yeah. And she's basically in emergency mode through the entire book because she's trying to, you know, grapple with the fact that her family's losing everything and her family's losing everything but like i said at the beginning the stakes are much lower because she has a sister who can provide for her as we're seeing through these books it's funny that her sister who can provide for her is the one that she's like basically babysitting i mean Anne is earning her keep let's say that but there isn't that same pragmatic thing where like Anne is going to live on the streets without anybody's help because she has a sister who can who can house her, which is, you know, th- that's the pressure that Jane Bennett was facing. That's the pressure Eleanor Dashwood was facing. That's like that is the economics in Jane, in, in Jane Austen in a nutshell. If you have only women in a family, that means one of them has to get married and the pressure is off because Mary got married in this family. But the, the things that Anne is facing are no, nonetheless quite intense. And similar to what Eleanor's facing, the like fall of her family and the 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 sort of unrequited pain in love that comes with you know a disappointment. So these are uh, those two characters are very similar, but it's like Eleanor is in emergency mode through the entirety of the book, whereas with Anne, it, I think it's just her natural state of being to like exist in these in these universes of. Um, taking care of others and having no one listen to her. Yeah. Ever. I don't think that's Eleanor's state. Eleanor's not quite as lonely. Yeah, she's got Marianne. Yeah, and even beyond Marianne, I mean, she has her buddy Colonel Brandon through the book. Yeah, her best friend. And I think, you know, at the end of the book, you know, Mrs. Dashwood even admits maybe she hasn't taken enough care of Eleanor in that last year, but it does mm-hmm. show that like there is someone in her life who loves her and at least cares about her well-being and doesn't really have that outside of Lady Russell. And Lady Russell and her have a point of contention on the thing that makes Anne the most upset. Yeah. Devastating. Devastating. We have a study question that I think is a good one to jump to. This book is often described as Austen's most deep or perhaps most serious work, but it is also very funny. How do you think that balance between the intense pining and heartache and humor plays in these chapters? We don't have many sassy, witty lines like the ones in P&P. Instead, we have Jane Austen in a rocking chair painting a hilarious picture. And that's from Cat. Yes, it is funny. It's very funny. And I it is Jane Austen in her rocking chair, particularly when she was talking about poor Richard. I was like, <laughs> girl, Jane. Yeah, no, it is very funny. Um, the balance, I think, is important because obviously, like, if it was just sad and depressing and like pining, it wouldn't shine as much unless it had these moments of levity. Have you watched Arrested Development? No. Okay, so you, the, this is a reference that'll be lost on you, but I think this is actually exactly correct as I think about it. Um, Arrested Development is the story of Michael Bluth and his crazy family losing all their money and him having to move them all into the one real estate development his dad made before he went to prison. And their family is like the most heinous rich people you've ever met in your life. Sounds like Shit's Creek. Except there's one member of the family trying to keep everyone's shit together. And it's a bit... It's a bit more cynical than Schitt's Creek because it's not like they learn their lessons. Sure, sure, they're, sure. The sort of plot of the show is that they're constantly torturing Michael with their antics and shenanigans while he's trying to like save them from financial ruin. And it's Jason Bateman playing Michael Bluth. And it's an underrated and subtle comedic performance that's genius because it's the perfect straight man performance. You have to have a straight man for how absurd everyone is around him. And it is actually a very impressive and hard thing to do to make the straight man as brilliantly funny as Jason Bateman does with Michael Bluth. Anne Elliott is the Michael Bluth of the situation. Absolutely. She's just like, throughout this whole chapter, all I could picture is like, her and then like a whirlwind of stuff around her people coming to her and being like you'll never believe what this person said and then you'll never believe what this person said and then they're like fighting through her and she's just like oh yeah yep Mm -hmm. yep Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah it was hilarious I can see why people think this one's more intense than others I actually don't think it's her most serious work personally from the ones I've read but that's you know we'll, we'll get there but I do think there is just a magic to a brilliantly written straight man or straight woman here mm-hmm. um and Anne Elliot is kind of like a perfect straight man. 
in these situations. A perfect straight man, something we've never heard said before. Lol, that's true. <laughs> except Mr. <laughs> oh, except Mr. Knightley for sure. Okay, last question for chapter six. First impressions of the Crofts. What what do the Crofts give us in the story? So far, the Crofts are just a very kind, nice middleman, I guess. Um, I mean, they're an excuse for them to see Wentworth. I mean, it's very early on in the story, but you meet them and there's an immediate mesh yes. between Anne and the Crofts, mm-hmm. which is great because, you know, she's in love with their brother. Yes. Um, but I think this I want to get once again, pull this thread of the the Navy through the story. Oh, right. Yes. yes because yes. we have spent a lot of time talking shit about the upper classes of Jane Austen's world in this book. As much as we may enjoy them, they are ridiculous and kind of pushing Anne to her edge. Yes. Um, and the people from the Navy come in, Admiral and Mrs. Croft, and they are more Gentile than the Gentiles. Yeah. And they are new. Well, Admiral Croft is not new. He is gentry uh, by birth, but it gives you a very positive look at the, the world of the Navy, like a warm, worldly set of people that Anne clearly has like an affinity for. And Jane seems to have an affinity for in this book, she's telling a very specific story about the guys coming back from war. Yes. Yes. That they are like generally just a good set of people. They are shown to be in this portion of the book so far, somewhat the heroes. Yeah. Compared to the gentry who are kind of annoying, annoying and petty and stupid. Yeah. like, And he plays with the kids. They're grounded. They're happy and they're grateful to be like in this society. I just wanted to flag that as sort of a an ongoing theme in the book. Mm-hmm. All right. So Janae asked the the money question, which obviously I had on my list as well, but I'm going to give it to Janae, our uh, wonderful patron. Um, first impressions of Captain Wentworth. <laughs> OK, so many things. Um, first impressions were beautiful, handsome, um, hot, hot. And generally, like, I thought that Anne was reading too much into things by thinking he was avoiding her. But then as we progressed, I saw that that was not the case and that he is, in fact, pissed at her and is avoiding her. And you know what? Rightfully so. So generally, like, I I, I feel bad for him. Like, I love him already, but I'm devastated for him. Like, I do feel very much, quote, on his side in the conflict that is him and Anne because if you picture it when you get dumped no matter what the reason is there's going to be some resentment there and particularly if you're blindsided the way he was and if you're so clear on the fact that she is doing this just to please other people and like not prioritizing you you're going to walk away from that and spend the next eight years teaching your brain to hate that person because being mad at them is easier than being in love with them still. Oh, yes. Very well put. Because if he had been just polite and indifferent to her, that would not be a fun story. He's furious. Yeah. And you can tell. Yeah. And that tells you something. (laughs) I would also say, like, we talked about this briefly a little bit, but the difference between Anne's eight years and Wentworth's eight years is very telling here. So let's discuss that a little bit. Well, I think I was going to mention this earlier, but like we talk about the fact that the last eight years have aged her and like in a negative way and he is aged like fine wine. And I was saying how that's a little bit sexist because like why do the women have to bear the brunt of the uh, devastation? But I think it's symbolic here of the fact that she broke his heart and has to suffer for that and he karma karma's a bitch you should have known better <laughs> don't quote jojo siwa i'm on this so sorry part. i'm so sorry um but karma is a bitch and he has gotten his money he's gotten his promotion he's gotten hotter and he like gets these small comforts because he got his heart broken i i like this as an idea of fate but i actually think there's another way to look at it as mm-hmm. well which is um and i agree with you that like there is a tinge of sexism here like the women age, women age as poorly and manage as well that's stupid yeah women age like Helen Mirren so it's fine yes um but Anne has spent eight years mired in regret and that has wasted her yes like yeah she, she has um 
agonized over her decision since she made it. Because she knows it was wrong. Because she feels deep in her heart that it was wrong. Yeah. And that she should not have done that and she would be a happier person. And she lost eight years of her life that would have been happy and loving to um, the whims and wills of other people. Wentworth has not spent eight years with regret. He has spent eight years with a chip on his shoulder. Yes. And spite. Exactly. And when you have to prove your ex wrong about who you were as a person. Oh, you get hotter. Oh, you get hotter. You get richer. And we like, remember, we learned this about Wentworth when we first met him in the book in chapter four. He's always been extremely ambitious. Yes. He's been a dreamer for himself. He's been someone who believes he's going to make something of himself. And what better motivation to make that actually happen than the woman who didn't believe in you enough to fight for you in front of her family? She didn't believe in him. And that's the worst thing for him. Like, he's like, oh, my God, you didn't think that I could do it. Yes. And I mean, I, I think we both agree that Anne did think he could do it. Right. But that he doesn't know that. Yeah. Because it's, she didn't tell him that. She didn't prove that to him. Yeah, she didn't She didn't fight for him. No. She, like, I, I was just talking about this with a friend. You need to be with someone who's going to fight for you. Yes. And that's what's got him so pissed. And that's kind of why I understand why Wentworth is pissed with her, even though his way of dealing with it is kind of cruel, is that when you love someone, the most devastating thing that can happen is that they, you know you would fight through heaven and earth for them and you're devastated by the fact that they wouldn't do the same for you yeah it's so heartbreaking for him so as much as it's painful to hear him kind of shit on our girl here who's already going through it she like doesn't need this right like I get why he looked at her and he was like you are not the woman I fell in love with eight years ago and fuck you yeah I, I am my own man now and I'm going to find my own way and she stopped being the woman that he fell in love with eight years ago the minute she said I'm gonna do what my family tells me to yeah it's and he like, was like he, that was it that was it well he he needs to spend so many years understanding that like he can't love her because of what she did mm -hmm. and for Anne like, that's why these years have nourished him and broken her. Yeah. Because she's sitting there being like, I made the mistake of not fighting for him. I made the mistake of uh, thinking I wouldn't be as happy with him. And instead, now I sit with this idea that I will never find a, a match like that again. I will never find someone who understands me that way. Yeah. Again. And, and he's been honing his standards. He has been honing his life his life it. he's like okay yeah I wasn't good enough for you but look at what I can do yeah and he doesn't need her uh it is heartbreaking just I mean, she has spent the last eight years stewing in self-hatred and knowing that she was wrong and, and knowing that she was weak and internalizing that and becoming depressed and quiet and lonely and shutting herself down because she feels so deeply how weak she was about this. And he is like not trying to be with a weak person. Uh, there's so much to unpack here and I don't want to go too far into it because obviously we have a book to read. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I mean, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say these things might come up again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> So let's go forward. I think I have two more questions and we've touched on these two as well, but I just want to like run through them quickly. Uh, we have a clear cut story of what Wentworth wants right now. Mm -hmm. um, what do we learn about his side of the story? Like, what do we learn from where he's at right now? Well, it's tough because on the one hand, he's saying that he like he will marry. He wants to get married. We know he wants to get married. And he sarcastically says that he will marry any woman between the ages of 15 and 30, that he like he will take whatever comes his way. But it's hard to tell if that's actually true because he also has some level of standards. I think he clearly doesn't want to get stuck with someone like Anne who would not fight for him like he has a standard in that like he wants to end up with someone who's gonna stay with him on the other hand he wants to end up with someone like Anne who loves him that much oh my god it's hard I don't know I don't know if he's gonna settle or if he's gonna look for love I don't know what he wants but at least we know that that's what he's on the hunt for he is a single man in possession of a good fortune in want of a wife exactly and that is a truth universally acknowledged 
Yes. Yes. Uh, last question. Um, I want to focus in on a line you read aloud that in which Wentworth describes Anne as someone of feeble character. Yes. Is he right? Yes. You think he's right? Yes. Uh, I think that for him, what he knows about her is that she caved. We've talked about Bingley being someone who needs 12 opinions. Anne isn't necessarily someone who needs 12 opinions. I think Anne is someone who's not going to make a choice. She lets other people, at least eight years ago, she let other people make her choices for her. I mean, it's it's a different situation because, I mean, Bingley made the choice when he really didn't have to, you know, because he was a man. Yes. Who had a lot of options. Yes. And uh, Jane Bennett was one of those options. And he was kind of persuaded, it's in the title, away from her because of reasons of propriety. Yeah. I think with Anne, it's a little different. And I think it like, I, w- I want to be a little bit more fair to Anne. And like, this is this is an agonizing debate. I think we're going to have a lot through the book because I think like Jane Austen is showing you there is a kernel of truth to what Wentworth is saying about her. Right now, I'm totally on his side. Yeah, I I, I live I, I live somewhere between at this moment. Um, But I think at the same time, it's kind of like she was 19. She was. And <laughs> and she was under a lot of pressure from a family that thinks so highly of themselves. And the only person she trusts. And the only person she trusts who may or may not be worthy of that trust um, because she also is guilty of a lot of the same things that Anne's family is guilty of in terms of like self-importance and blah, 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 blah. But I think that in that moment she was weak. And, and I think that despite the fact that she has spent the last eight years punishing herself for it, Wentworth doesn't know that. That's correct. And he also doesn't, I mean, like, the moment that is frozen in time for him is such a painful one that like one can understand why he comes to this conclusion. Uh, my question is not whether or not it's fair for him to think that. Sure, it's whether it's true. I mean, it's a good question. <laughs> I don't think we have to answer it right now. We can leave it kind of open-ended because we only know our heroine so much right now. And I think there's a, we have a lot of pity for Anne, which is not like the best feeling to have towards the protagonist but I think we also are both developing a lot of love for her no I for sure and I think okay a feeble character is 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 maybe harsh but that she did act of feeble character I don't think that in her heart of hearts and soul she is feeble it's it's hard to discern it's hard to figure out in this moment there's so much of this that happened so long ago and obviously like it seems like obviously the wrong call right now mm-hmm. but I think that that's what Jane Austen wants us to focus on so heavily is Anne Feeble of character. Like, what are her flaws and are they forgivable? And how wrong is Wentworth? Is he wrong at all? Is is a question that Jane is asking us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, she's a, she is a victim of her circumstances or a product of her circumstances, rather. So it's something that I'm sure we will continue to interrogate. I think we just have to stick a pin in it for yeah. right now because it's too juicy a question yes. for us to answer yeah. at this point. Ooh. Um, which leads us to our standby's funniest quote. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is of course about uh Mary and Charles. And I don't there were actually maybe some funnier quotes, but I didn't read this one, so I'll read it. One of the least agreeable circumstances of her residence there was her being treated with too much confidence by all parties and being too much in the secret of the complaints of each house. Known to have some influence with her sister, she was continually requested, or at least receiving hints to exert it, beyond what was practicable. I wish you could persuade Mary not to be always fancying herself ill, was Charles' language, and in an unhappy mood, thus spoke Mary. I do believe if Charles were to see me dying, he would not think there was anything the matter with me. I am sure, Anne, if you would, you might persuade him that I am really very ill, a great deal worse than I ever own. I just thought it was funny. It was the beginning of the back and forth of the let's all tell Talk Anne. Shit. Yeah. It's so good, especially because Mary is like, like, Mary is an icon and a legend, and I kind of have to stand, even though she's a mess. Oh, I 100% stand. I <laughs> yes. love her. Questions moving forward? Does Captain Wentworth want to marry one of the Musgrove daughters? Because I know that that was floated by uh, our narrator, and I don't want that for, <laughs> for him or for Anne. Um, that would be particularly painful for Anne, I think, uh, because they are family. Who wins the chapter? I got to give this to Captain Wentworth because he is winning. Yeah, Captain is doing his best right now. Um, He's rich. He's hot. He won the breakup. 
that's all anyone wants to do. Yes. <laughs> yes. And also, like, we love to meet a new hot main character man. Yeah. Hot main character man is the key to Captain Wentworth's charm. He is hot and the main character at the same time. Yes. He is. I I, I will say like this. He, there is something about like the dashing sailor. Yes. In this. That's like different than like the sort of like stuffy gentry men we've had so far. Oh, yeah. Like, he is a little bit more of a Leo DiCaprio sort of vibe. He's a little rugged. Yes. Like he's more um, windswept. Yeah. Dashing. Dashing. Yeah. Buoyant. I don't know. Yeah. We'll like see. there's our only other uh, army or military man we've had so far is Colonel Brandon, mm -hmm. who is dreamy in his own right, but is very like subdued. Yeah. And Wentworth is kind of lively. Yeah. Lively. Ooh, I can't wait to get to know him more. Mm. All right, listeners, that concludes this like slightly spicy ending of uh, this episode of Pod and Prejudice. If you would like to submit study questions to have read aloud on the show, you can join our Patreon at the $15 tier. And then Molly will post a Google Doc before every episode and you can submit your questions and we will ask them on air. Molly, do you have any other things to add? No, I just, I can't wait. I'm loving this book so far. So. It's so good. Well, for next time, we're going to read uh, chapters eight and nine. So until next time, stay proper. And show up dashing eight years later to make your ex regret her choices. Yes, exactly. Yes. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.